I came across a, a passage this week in Luke chapter 9, verses 28 through 36 that unsuspectingly um, pointed towards uh, Christmas and the celebration that it is. So it was, uh, it, it's exciting. It, the, God's wisdom is so much higher than ours and uh, His provision is abounding all the time, I would suppose. I, I, I wondered to myself, um, but this, this story in Luke 9, 28 through 36 is, is a story. It's called the Transfiguration in Scripture. And it says this event in Scripture um, where Peter, James, and John did the inner circle of Jesus' apostles and they follow him up on the mountain to pray. And if you remember last week's message, we talked about this whole kind of uh, these qualifications for discipleship, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. And, and so the context for this is, is Jesus tells his apostles, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. You're going to sacrifice, I mean, in, in my translation, you're going to sacrifice like you've never sacrificed before. Uh, there's going to be a lot of confusion. You're going to give up things you never thought. The world must become dim that your love for Christ would be, you know, even more passionate. And, oh, by the way, he leads them in and, and gives them this transfiguration, what Scripture calls it. So it's just an, this amazing thing. I, it, it occurred to me what I was starting to say earlier. What it was like for them to follow Jesus around day after day. Have you ever thought about this? I mean, one day he's taken, you know, two fish and three loaves. And, and he's feeding, you know, 5,000 people plus women and children. You know, 10,000, 12,000 people with just a little bit. Um, he's healing people that are blind. Um, they, they dig the roof out and drop a guy down in front of him to heal. I mean, this stuff, you, I, I, I really wonder what it was like. I'm not saying I wanted to be one of the apostles because that meant I would have been crucified upside down or something like that. Oh, but to walk with Jesus, I mean, I, it must have been an adventure like none other. I bet there was no rabbi that had these kind of stories to tell. Can you imagine if they got together and compared stories? Wouldn't that be great? To hear them talk about the work that, that Christ did while he was here, the different thing, it's, it's, it's fantastic. So the characters uh, out of this passage, first of all, is God the Father. Um, and there, you hear from all of them. God the Father is involved here in this, in this story. Um, Jesus is obviously there. Uh, his three disciples, three closest disciples, if you notice throughout Scripture, um, there was the 12 that Jesus called, designated to be apostle, and he really intensifies his training for those 12. But then he has an inner circle of three, Peter, James, and John. James and John were brothers. Um, Peter was a wild card, <laughs> and he was the kind of unspoken leader of the group, uh, was an outspoken, passionate, kind of charismatic individual. And you see it come out again and again in Scripture as you watch him react. Uh, he reacts a lot of times off the cuff, he says things, and then you think later, he goes, I probably shouldn't have said that, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> he, he doesn't always think through what he says, it, it appears, uh, as you listen to him. And then there's two interesting characters that show up in this story, and they are Moses and Elijah. And um, if you know who Moses and Elijah are from your reading in Scripture, they're both from the Old Testament. Uh, Moses was there really early on. He was the one that God gave the law to in the very beginning, and and. Uh, the Ten Commandments came through Moses from God, tablets, you know. And uh, Elijah was there too, probably the, considered the greatest of prophets was Elijah, uh, of the prophets that were. So it's just this fantastic arrangement uh, in this story. So let me, get, let me just read it. Um, I think it has a, quite a bit of impact, and I won't try to summarize it. I'll just read it today. Starting in verse 28, about eight days after Jesus said this, he's talking about his qualifications for discipleship. I referenced those earlier. He took Peter, Jan, John, and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure or his decease. Everyone had, interpret the Greek there, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. 
As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. <laughs> Remember I said Peter says stuff and then thinks about it later? Here's one of them. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son. Whom I have chosen, listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and did not tell anyone at that time what they had seen. So, <clears throat> the power of God is, is illustrated in so many ways here. And let me just say at the beginning here, this borders um, the ability of humankind to comprehend the work of God. There's stuff here that I can't fully wrap my head around. Um, and this, this is borderline of human comprehension right here. God's ways are so far above ours, and there's, there's so many implications of this. Uh, and so it, it's this kind of, it makes me appreciate that God's ways are higher than mine. I think if I followed all the implications of a passage like this, uh, I would, you know, probably lose my gourd. Not that my gourd's not off a little anyway. So the first thing I want to I bring out here is this. Uh, number one, from this passage today. By, by the way, this passage comes at such a wonderful time of the year. Because I think it's a real encouragement to our hearts. It gives us a glimpse into what Christmas was really about. Uh, so it's, it's wonderful. So first of all, heaven reaches out. So... I find it interesting, and this is just me musing about this event. Jesus is having a conversation with Moses and Elijah. It seems at first glance insignificant. However, let me, let me give you a couple things that I considered. Moses pointed towards Christ while his work was here. Elijah points towards Christ in his work here. Uh, scripture is full of prophecy that points toward Jesus. All of Scripture points towards Christ. It is, he is the redemption of, He is the pinnacle of God's grace. He's the redemption of mankind. It's the whole reason, uh, the whole reason of Scripture. But I thought about it. Jesus is having a conversation with Moses, Elijah, and it's a familiar conversation. Do you know what that means? He'd had conversation with them before. All the years that they had been dead before this event, they show up here in their glorious splendor, their glorious new bodies. Do you know where they were before Jesus was born? They were hanging out with him, according to Scripture, in, in God's wonderful glory. Now, my mind just about explodes there. So here's what it means. Christ was with God in the beginning. From the very beginning. The Word was John. The Word was with God. The Word was God. That's Jesus who he's talking about. He's with God in heaven in the beginning. And all through the ages, Moses and the prophets, they come and they do their work and they die and, and they go to heaven. And in their glorified, they're hanging out with Jesus. And, and so, so watch what happens. They show back up. To, to do what? Are, are they encouraging Christ? You're, like to be, you're about to do something here that makes all of our work true. Is this Elijah and Moses saying, look, we, we started something, Jesus, but you're about to finish it. Hang in there. Kind of, is, is that how the conversation goes? There's, it, it, it's tall weeds, I know. We're into the cabbage. It's good stuff. But I wonder how those things went, how those conversations went. There's a quote here from one student. He says this, The adoring gratitude of glorified men, talking about Moses and Elijah, for his undertaking to accomplish, accomplish such a decease, their felt dependence upon it for the glory in which they appeared, their profound interest in the progress of it. They're interested in the progress of what Jesus is getting ready to accomplish. 
their humble solaces and encouragements to go through with it and their sense of its peerless and overwhelming glory. Um, let me throw one more wrinkle in here and just see if this will pop your head off your shoulders. They, they experience God's salvation before it actually happens. No man comes to the Father but through the Son. He hadn't even sacrificed for their sins, and it's 500 years later. And they're already there. Look, okay, God is so big, like, right, you're going, huh, what? Yeah, so I did the same thing. God's ways are so much higher than ours. I'm glad I don't have to unravel this all for everybody and say, all right, here's, okay, here's what's really going on. It, he is so wonderful. He is so God. He is so above us that when I, when I put this into comparison to what we understand and what we know and what we can accomplish and what we can even accomplish in our own holiness, it just seems putrid and puny and insignificant to Him be the glory. Amen. There's just no way to really... Yeah. Like, I'm here and I'm a recipient of all this... So, I want to talk about the significance of the fact that Elijah and Moses show up. I think there's significance in the fact that it's those two specific individuals. It's quite interesting. Uh, Moses is the one through whom the original covenant came through. The law came through Moses. And part of Christmas is ushering, part of the birth of Christ was ushering in the beginning of this new covenant. So Moses was very important. He was very instrumental. I, I consider probably the greatest leader in all the Old Testament. If, it's, if we're comparing. I, we're splitting hair here. I get it. I, I, Moses' heart for the people, and you, you heard me talk about this through the prayer series, was just fantastic. He was such a good leader. A, a, a man among boys, really. A, a prince among men, if you will. That's, that's how I feel when somebody brings me a fresh hot cup of coffee <laughs> right after dessert. It's a prince among men. Moses was this guy. And then you fast forward, we get to Elijah, same thing. Of all the prophets, of all the people that God set to lead his people, Elijah was arguably the greatest. And in fact, some thought that Elijah had come back. That's how big what Jesus was doing was. And so what's the, what's the significance of this? Well, these two men who are part of the old covenant, the original covenant, the law, begin to, they're there to help usher in the new covenant. I, I absolutely love this part. The fact that God, by the way, he puts this all up there in scripture for us to see and to ponder and to meditate. God, he went through so much to deliver to us salvation. It's absolutely fabulous. So just watch what happens here. So, and I hope I don't get lost in the weeds. We're going to get all the way to Christmas here in just a little bit. It's, it's, it's fantastic. The law was holy and right, representing Moses and even Elijah in the leading of God's people in obeying the law. The law, though, it was limited in what it could achieve. We've talked about this before. In the law could only expose what was bad. Man could not fully obey it. And therefore, the law was powerless to make men holy. While the law was holy, it only exposed that men were sinful because they couldn't keep the law and thereby they were condemned by it. So this interesting concept. Think, oh, oh, the law didn't have the power to make men holy. They could obey it perfectly. Well, first of all, that was the problem. No one could obey it perfectly. And so there was a problem because they couldn't obey it perfectly. They were guilty of breaking all of it. And so they stood guilty, condemned before God, all of mankind, unable to keep the law. And so this is, this is where it gets good. God sends his son. Uh, by the way, don't, don't miss this. Now we're back to Christmas. Jesus is in heaven hanging out in all his glory. By the way, he's standing here and his, his clothes are like a flash of lightning. Any of you ever drove after dark in the middle of a thunderstorm? And you see a flash of lightning zigzag across the sky so brilliantly that when it goes away, you're still seeing a flash of lightning. That's his clothes. 
And Elijah and Moses are standing there in their glorified bodies. The whole scene is surreal, like out of a sci-fi. You can't really wrap your mind. The glory that emanates from Jesus is the glory that is really His. It's the glory that He sets aside when He comes and is in a little baby in a manger far away, far away from the kingship that is His. And He submits Him to say, Is there any wonder that heaven splits open and angels, millions of them, sing glory to God on the highest. Isn't this wonderful? This is our king. And, and by the way, here's the significance of this. The heavens burst open as Christ submits himself to this body of a newborn baby. He's about to wet his diaper. <laughs> and he submits himself to this that he can rescue all of mankind. It's absolutely beautiful, this plan. And he does that to usher in a new covenant. That The new covenant now, let me finish with this thought and then we'll go on. That he would now usher in a new covenant. What's the power of the new covenant? It's this, by the way, all the prophets talked about it. They all talked about it. And I don't, it, it occurred to me, did they really know what they were saying? We, we had Jeremiah, we talked about Jeremiah earlier. Isaiah's. And here he says, I will give you a new heart. This is Isaiah pointing toward Christ. Just one of many examples. He says, I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Jeremiah 31 kind of says the same thing. And, and here's what he's saying. Here's what the prophets were all pointing to. They were basically saying to, to the people to come. God's go, there's a time going to come when... When, when God's going to speak to His people directly. The new covenant meant this. That when you accepted Christ according to Scripture. He would put in each heart. The indwelling Holy Spirit. That would allow us. Enable us to know the full will of God. According to His will and His grace. Moment by moment. Not only would He write His law on our hearts. He would go one step further. By the way. This is the key to the new covenant. He would go one step further, and by the power of His Holy Spirit in us, He would help us to obey it. He sealed the deal with the indwelling Holy Spirit in each one who accepted Christ. It blows my mind. When we come to this passage here, what fascinates me is that in this moment, Jesus is just... just a short time away from the crucifixion in this passage. And yet the ramifications back to Easter. And, and heaven, by the way, all of heaven is in on the deal. <laughs> like the only people in the dark are people. <laughs> all of heaven is in on this thing. All of heaven is sitting there while their king is on earth. Accomplishing the redemption of mankind. All of heaven is in on the deal. And so in this particular case, heaven reaches out. And God sends, it's no coincidence that while Jesus is praying, God sends Moses and Elijah. You know what I want to know? I want to know what kind of prayer it takes to get Moses and Elijah to visit you. <laughs> Like my gourd would really split open if that happened. I don't think it's an accident that, that Jesus is spending this deep time of prayer with the Father in the middle of the night. It's dark. His disciples are, it's whatever hour it is, his disciples are sleeping. They can't hardly get to sleep. And when they finally come to, there's this... This, this heavenly display for them to see. I don't know how you could encourage one more than this. And so heaven reaches out to Christ and, and just go be our hope is in you all of heaven's hope. Think about this. All the glorified bodies of men and women who had went before. Where were they? Two waiting, hoping for the redemption that was Christ. It's, it's, it's mind-boggling. All right, let's go on. A glimpse of glory. I wonder if the disciples later said, 
you know, because this is their rabbi, they knew Jesus well. They ate with him, drank with him, they fellowship with him. I wonder if they said to themselves, did you see his clothes? <laughs> did you see what happened to him? The glory that was his. Um, there's, a, there's this there's visual testimony of, of what awaited them. I think this is, this is hope for the disciples. Um, they get a glimpse into heaven. They see, they see Moses and Elijah. And by the way, don't miss this. They didn't. I'm sure of it. They realized their hope lay there as well. That, that God would not let down those who placed their trust in him. That eternity looked like that in a glorious body. With dwelling with the Father in heaven. It, this was their destiny. For them, can you imagine uh, what they were getting ready to face? Some things that were pretty tough. And ultimately, they would all give their life for their faith except one. The one whom Jesus loved, John, did not die persecuted or crucified for his faith. All the other 11 did. And they were all faced with this. They were all going to die for their faith except the one. And do you think in those moments when they were hurting, facing death by fire, death by crucifixion, or whatever means of evil torture could be dreamt up to end their earthly walk, that they didn't have a flashback to that moment with Jesus and Moses and Elijah? That they remembered that God's glory awaited them. That they remembered that this earth and our trappings of it, they are so dim in compared, comparison to the brilliance of the glory of heaven. Do you think they understood that their lives were quite temporary here and really what mattered was heaven? Really what mattered was eternity. And I think it was encouragement for them. The apostle Paul, the apostle given to the Gentiles, he, he summarizes it well in Romans. He said, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I think Peter had a conversation. I think Peter had a conversation with these guys. After Christ ascended, and these apostles spent time together, he summarizes beautifully the glory of heaven that awaits and the power of Christ to deliver us into the arms of the Father. It's a glorious, it is a glorious promise. <clears throat> I think this, so I had this, I kind of saw it like this. That the giving of this event, it, it was in a real encouragement to Jesus. is a real encouragement to the apostles. And I think it's a real encouragement to us. So let's go to the third one. There's hope for the journey. It, it, it was given to encourage us um, for every age. I wanted to ask you guys, maybe there's somebody here. When's the last time a cloud covered you and God spoke? <laughs> you know, sometimes I'm just thick enough. Sometimes when I pray for God's will to be done, I want him to communicate in this kind of clear way. But again, I think if he did, I would probably lose my gourd. Uh, but he does that for, for whose benefit? He, does, he spoke directly to the, those three apostles. He says, this is my son. He's not talking to Elijah or Moses. He's speaking directly to Peter, ja Peter, James, and John. He said, this is my son whom I have chosen. Now listen to him. And I, I, I think about the fact that there's confusion surrounding the crucifixion for his disciples. They, they, don't, they don't quite get the whole picture. Now... After kind of examining what all the stuff that Jesus walked through them, I'm not sure how they didn't get it, but I have the benefit of, you know, hindsight's always 2020. I have that benefit. So they weren't getting it. So there was going to be a bunch of confusion. And so, again, I think it's one of those things where 
where God speaks very clearly to them, and it's to cut through the fog of the confusion of the crucifixion that's still waiting in the wings. It still hasn't happened. There's dark days ahead for these guys. There's dark days ahead. And if it is true in this world, Jesus said, you will have trouble. There's dark days ahead for some of us. Probably all of us. There's dark days ahead. Dark days like days when you will contend with the enemy. You will contend with your flesh. You will contend with the evilness that is our world. You will contend with the necessity to eke out a living in this planet and dwell here and love others well with it and still not allow it to capture the passion of your heart. There's going to be dark days ahead. And so I think this gives us so much hope. But one is, is this perspective of a physical death. Think about those glorified bodies as Elijah and Moses stand there. That's what awaits us. That's what awaits us. How dim then do the things of this world that capture our hearts and our passions, how dim do they seem in, in comparison to this wonderful experience that the disciples got to be a part of? How, how dim is it? The stuff that we pursue, the fleshly desires that we sometimes serve, how dim do they feel in comparison to this? They seem... Is filthy the right word? They hold no comparison. I think of our I think of one of the other big struggles of this world, and that's our relationships with one another. And we struggle sometimes to get those right. And yet this heaven awaits us. And we can't love others well. Um, something wrong in here. Spending, it, it, it gives it to this, it comes to this bottom line. Spending our physical lives for heaven seems like a bargain price to me. That if we would pour our lives out for the sake of the kingdom and we get to experience ten times what we saw here, it's, it's a bargain, it's like a two for one. You know, even Peter in this moment, he misses it. We, we do this. We get so caught with this in this trap of we love what the world has to offer. You know what Peter says? Oh, God, boy, this is great. You know what? Let's put up shelters. <laughs> Let's capture the moment. Let, let, let's do this again. This was awesome. You don't think his heart was thumping in his chest? This was emotional. He loved it. This interaction with Jesus and his glory seeing it was just... It, it, what's Peter thinking at that point? He's off the cuff with the remark, but what's he thinking? i, I got to see this again. We do that in a little bit different sense. Our, our worship... Gets put on that pedestal. People who preach God's word. They get put on that pedestal. Of, of Oh boy that was awesome. I, I got to do that again. Easy. How about a little obedience? How about a little obedience? The real mark of maturity of men. So let's, let's guard against that. That we don't quit too early. That we don't, we don't allow our hearts to be captured by stuff on this earth that would take us away from the glory that God has for us. For, for the, the splendor of heaven that awaits us. That gives us a little glimpse of it. It makes, by the way, makes every sacrifice you make here worth it. It makes them seem insignificant compared to the glory that is heaven that awaits all of us. So don't quit too early. I think Peter gets so enthralled with his glimpse of heaven. He gets so ca caught up in it that he's like, you know what? We got to do this again. And I think sometimes and I was talking about how we get caught up in this. I think sometimes it looks like us in the body. 
It's like we, we love our church. We love our fellowship. Let, let's, just, let's, just, let's just dance right in this circle until Jesus comes back. And what Jesus said was go and make disciples. He said don't dance in your circle too long. Your end's coming. You get just a short little amount of time and then you're done. And that's enough to set you up for eternity. Make good decisions. Don't get caught dancing in the same circle the whole 25, 30, 50 years you got left. Don't, don't lose sight of the big picture. Go make disciples. Others need to know about this. The same job that awaited Peter, James, and John while they glimpsed God's glory awaits us. Go and make disciples. And when you get a glimpse of heaven, it makes it all seem worth it. It makes it all seem wonderful. Again, the sacrifice um, is right. I know that this gives me hope for a future. For what God wants to do. May our lives as a body, as we journey together, may our lives... Bring Him glory. May our lives be poured out for the sake of the kingdom. Are we brave enough to pray that prayer and speak that word? Say, God, do, do with this temporary time whatever you must. Whatever you must. Can, can we surrender to that level? Where we stop, with the, we stop with the distractions and just say, God, use it. Use my life. It's not very long. Use it for the future. If you have been with us today on Facebook, live, or YouTube, thank you for being with us. We uh, appreciate having you, and we will be back next week, same time, same place. Bless you all real good.